Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Rocker Report. I'm Chris Wynn and today we are fortunate enough to be speaking to someone who was an incredible player and servant for Sunderland who first signed for the club one month before I was born, which is, uh, which is scary. And his fourth spell with the club ended only three years ago. Uh, he made 270 appearances for Sunderland over three spells as a player and held either the role of first team coach or assistant manager under four different Sunderland managers over the years, according to my quick tally anyway. Uh, we, of course, privileged to be talking to Paul Bracewell. Welcome, Paul. Welcome. Good evening. Yeah, great to speak to you. Uh, first of all, how are you keeping during these strange times? Yes, well, thanks. Um, obviously, it's been uh, difficult for everybody, but just making sure that uh, we stick to the rules and yeah, have you been able to to keep busy? Yeah, there's yeah, there's plenty going on. I've been working from home on on Zoom and and Teams, um, but uh, I'm working down at Tottenham at the moment, and the lads are on. They usually have June off, so it's given me plenty of time to uh, to get all the stuff done around the house, like most people, gardens, cars, you name it. It's been getting done. Good stuff. So I'll, I'll, I want to circle back to you to your current roles uh, towards the end, but uh, I want to get straight into your career because, um, well. I mean, what a career for a start. Um, and I'm obviously desperate to get on to the, the Sunderland spells. But, I mean, I want to take you straight back to, uh, all the way back to Stoke um, as you make your breakthrough, 17, 18-year-old. And it's Alan Durbin who sees the, your potential as he's just taken Stoke back into Division 1. Uh, how much of an influence was, was Alan Durbin in those early years? Yeah, I was uh, I was 15 at the time, left, left school and got offered an apprenticeship at Stoke. Uh, like you said, Alan was the... Uh, was the manager at the time. Um, in those days, an apprenticeship was an apprenticeship. Long days, long hours. Uh, Tony Lacey was my youth coach at the time. Really enjoyed my spell there. Managed to make my debut at 17. Came on as sub against uh, Wolves and then made me first full debut for Stoke. I think it was against Liverpool at Anfield. So welcome to the <laughs> big time, as they say. Joined my spell there. And then... Um, and Alan left and, and, and went up to, to Sunderland. I think I stayed there for another year. And then, uh, and then I joined him after that. Yeah, was it a surprise when Alan Durbin left uh, left to take the Sunderland job? Yeah, I think it was. It was a surprise. Um, enjoyed working with him. Um, Howard Kennel was there uh, at the time as as, um, as one of the coaches. Dennis Smith was playing. Uh, I played alongside Dennis as well. So later on in my career, obviously, there's the connection with those two. Yeah, um, think... But uh, Alan Alan left, and that was it. Yeah, I think uh, I think Dennis Smith was suffering with his injuries by the time. Uh, he came through but um, as, he, as he said uh, it takes him I think it took a couple of years in, in June 1983 you partnered with about a quarter of a million to bring you to Roger Park for, for your first spell was that move all about linking up again with Durban? Yeah I was out of contract and in those days it was uh, different to what it was now they agreed a fee of, of I think it was like you said 250 grand travelled up and obviously I had worked with um, with Alan before so I knew him but for me it was a I think it was 19. It was, a, it was a big move, obviously, going to a big club like Sunderland. A lot of pressure, a lot of expectation. Yeah. First time that I'd gone to, obviously, a new area, a new club, new dressing room, new, new teammates. It was all very new for me as well. Um, but obviously, I was looking forward to the, uh, to the challenge. Yeah, well, I mean, you're still only 21 at the time, so it must have been a huge move. Yeah, like I said, it, it's when you work with young players uh, until you've actually moved club. Because if you've been at a club, you know, since you're since I was fifteen, and you get to know everybody, and everybody knows you, and then you're uprooting, you move, and it's a it's a totally new experience. You're walking into a dressing room, everybody's looking at you. What's he all about? You know. But no, I I, I enjoyed the, the the first. You know, I was there at time for three years, but I was only there for for one season. Yeah, and I mean, in so many cases in the history of uh, Sunderland, um, the 83-84 season when you were there was, uh, of course, one of turmoil in the boardroom, as it always is. And despite, uh, we were kind of four points clear at the drop, building a decent side with the likes of, obviously, yourself and Nick Pickering, Barry Venison, Sean Elliott, Leighton James was in there. Um, and then, well, obviously, with the turmoil with Tom Curry, I mean, Durban is sacked after an away defeat to Manchester United and replaced by Len Ashurst. I mean, were the thoughts in your mind that you might kind of need to leave as soon as Alan Durban left that year? Not really. It was a surprise to everybody, you know, not only to, to the players, I think the supporters as well, because I think they were seeing signs of, of, of Alan building a young a young team, ambitious. There was a nice blend of youth and experience. And, you know, you've named a few players there. A lot of those players went on as well in their career. So signs were looking good. I was obviously disappointed that Alan left. That was me sort of first 
sort of sense of, 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 uh, of the manager getting sacked. Len Ashes came in, uh, had played for the club before, and we got to the end of the season and he wanted to bring his own people in. He wanted to generate some, some money to do that. And um, obviously I was sold so he could go and do his business. Yeah, and I mean, what I read, I mean, obviously you were, I read you were player of the season that year and, you know, there was a mass exodus over the next year or two. I mean, a lot of fans thought that team could have kicked on given the time. How much potential do you think that, that side had? Yeah, like I said, it was it was a nice it was a nice mixture of youth with some experienced players in there as well. Um, it was a, it was a good sort of feeling I think between the team and, and, and the supporters. I think they, they sent something. Um, but in football, you just you just never know. Things happen, you know, uh, very quickly. And like I said, a, a lot of the players, you know, I met with one or two further along. But um, at the time, there was some there was some exciting players there. You know. Yeah, I mean, obviously. You uh, you make a huge leap up the football ladder right, when you move to FA Cup holders Everton. How Kendall parts with just under half a million to take you to to Merseyside. I mean, I can't imagine that would have taken too much uh, kind of twisting of the arm to sign for Everton at that point. But uh, was it a lot to do with Howard Kendall being there as well? I think to, to be honest, it was the, the season finished. Like I said, I think they were looking to generate cash. The season finished, and we were actually I was with the under twenty ones uh, European Championships, and we had. Uh, home and away leg in the final so season had finished and I was travelling down to I think Sunderland and, and Everton had, had agreed a fee I was travelling down to, to Heathrow we, I was flying out with the under 21s and me and my dad met Howard in the hotel obviously um, I knew Howard from when he was player coach at, at Stoke so again there was there was a sort of relationship there um, we agreed everything and did, didn't sign a contract but we shook on it I flew out with the under-21s and it was that week they had the cup final and came back and we, we won the European Championships, which was massive. I don't think it's ever been won since. So that was in 1985. And then everything that we agreed, they, they won the, the FA Cup final, which was great against Watford. So I was joining the FA Cup finalists and away I went, you know. Yeah, away you went. I mean, what a, what a first season. I mean, one of, one of the best in Everton's history, I think. Uh, won the first division title, UEFA Cup Winners' Cup, won the Charity Shield. One that got away maybe was runners-up in the FA Cup. And first season, I mean, you, you almost make uh, 60 appearances in all competitions. And incredibly, you're only 22 uh, throughout this season. Uh, is it safe to say that that was your best in football? Yeah, it was It was a very unique season. We were, you know, if we'd have won the FA Cup, that would have been the treble, you know, as well as the Charity Shield. And, you know, in today's game, if you said that, you had a chance to win the treble, it just shows you how, how hard and how difficult that is. And, and I think, I think you mentioned 60, I think with the international games, we were well into the 70s that, that season. Um, but I was joining a club, my first game was at Wembley against Liverpool and Charity Shield. We, we won that, we got beat the first two games of that season. And then, like you said, we went on to win the league, which was, you know, that, that everybody's dream about that and then obviously with, with Europe as well winning that and then obviously we're so disappointed in the first FA Cup final as well against Man United Yeah I mean absolutely incredible first season obviously in the in the middle with uh, with Peter Reid I mean did you two just kind of gel immediately in the in the middle of midfield and get a rhythm going? Yeah I think it was it was a sort of mutual respect mutual understanding all across the field there were some good players full of internationals and they always say the first trophy is the the most difficult and they'd obviously won that the, the FA Cup against Watford so they'd, they'd had a taste of it and they wanted more and you know I, I went into a dressing room where obviously I wanted to be successful but there was a lot of good players in there a lot of um, good people and a real hunger and desire to be successful yeah and I mean at the end of that season as well just you were capped three times by by England and your first was that summer of 1985 against West Germany I think according to to what I was reading and you were just about to turn 23 when you got your first cap, uh, did you feel like you were ready for international football, or I mean, how, how did you find that experience? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I think I made my debut. It was a World Cup qualifier against Northern Ireland that springs to mind, and then the same that year, eighty five, eighty six team. That that was the one that was pre Mexico. So we'd finished the world. Uh, we finished the FA Cup in May, and then we went straight out to Mexico. Mm-hmm. For three, well, for two weeks, and we had a week in in America on the way back, and that was the sort of pre squad for for Mexico, which again was was a you know fantastic honour to play for your country, and like you said, for me it was it was hopefully just the start of things to come, you know. Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, we're going to the the following season, and and you and Everton are flying again. I mean, you said you were pushing for a place in the '86 World Cup squad, and then you take a challenge from uh, Newcastle United's Billy Whitehurst on New Year's Day, 1986. And you suffer what what your first 
think is a, is a broken ankle, but then develops into a bit of a mystery that takes two and a half years to, to solve and, and recover from. I mean, obviously, during that time, you, you clearly suffered physically, but uh, I imagine to be out for that length of time after that initial success was, was kind of mentally tough to go through. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, in, when something like that happens, no injury is a good time, but for me, it was it was a nightmare to miss, you know, two and a half years when you're coming into your prime, not only with Everton, but with England as well. Uh, the, the frustration was, is, like you said, initially they thought it was broken, it wasn't, then there was some bone, we removed the bone, then you go into plaster for six weeks, then you do your rehab, then I was breaking down again. So I'd had five operations over that period, and, you know, two years is a long, is a long time to be out, but I always believe that I would get back and I eventually went to America uh, to see a guy called um, Roger Mann who was the top guy in the world on ankles and they managed to find a piece of bone and they operated there came back and then I managed to get back playing again but no you're right you know physically mentally it was, it was a real tough time having seen the other side of the, of the coin as they say having having been successful and then not being able to do what you want to do get up in the morning and go and play football was uh, soul destroying at times but I always had the belief I was going to come back and play. Incredible. I mean, you, you eventually make it back, as you said, which which was incredible during the 1988-89 season. And your last game uh, for Everton was that emotional 1989 FA Cup final against Liverpool, only five weeks after Hillsborough. I mean, obviously, FA Cup finals are always huge games, but I mean, I imagine this one felt different to the other Cup finals you played in. Yeah, it was the first all Merseyside you know, Cup final, and obviously because of the, the situation, and it was always going to be difficult. But I think... Uh, huge respect to both sort of players and and, and clubs. Uh, it was a great occasion and, and fitting tribute, really. Would you say at this point you were still kind of finding your fitness, or were you kind of feeling a hundred percent? Yeah, I mean, people say what you tend to do, rule of thumb is if you're out for six months, you know, it sometimes takes you sort of four or five months to get back. You know, I was out for for well over two years, which is a big chunk. So I was still trying to get myself back. I knew I wasn't going to be the player I was before. Um, in terms of medicals, I was never going to pass a medical. I had 50% less movement in one side, the ankle, and the other. But, you know, um, I was back playing football, which was which was brilliant. Yeah, and I mean, with that, even before that cup final, I mean, did you feel or, or even know that that was going to be your last game for Everton? Um, not really. It was, uh, I think Colin Harvey took over. Um, you know, I remember playing away at, uh, I think it was Sheffield Wednesday when I came back after injury and there was about five or 6,000 Nevertonians there and I just remember the reception. It, it was, you know, it was incredible really that they hadn't forgotten about you. You know, they remembered you but I always knew, you know, I, I was going to have to change my game a little bit because of the injury and then obviously I think pre-season came round and, and I knew I wasn't going to be involved as much and that and that's when the you know I spoke with Colin and said look I need to go and play football. I've, I've been out for an awful long time and at the moment, you know, the best thing for me is to go and go and play football and go on loan. So I spoke to Dennis Smith, again, the connection when I was at Stoke. Dennis was the manager at the time. And we agreed to go up for a month and just see how it goes. And I think that first month, there were six games in that month. And I know things went well. Again, because I'd been there before, I knew, I knew what the club was about and, and how big it could be. But for me, it was, it was again playing football. And then someone wanted to sign me. Uh, and I always remember on the Tuesday, I think it was my last game, and they did a medical and the, and the doc came in and, you know, the usual, no, he, he doesn't pass. And then he went up and he watched the last game, the doctor and said, I can't believe that's the same guy that I've, you know, um, just examined. And and that was it. It was one of those where he's, he's not going to pass a medical, but if you want to sign him, you can sign him, you know. I was recently uh, lucky enough to speak to, to Dennis Smith and, and I think this kind of conversation came up. And I think uh, I think the way he put it, he, he got the news that he had failed. And I think uh, he just turned to you and said, do you feel all right? And you went, yeah. And he went, that's good enough for me or something along those lines. Yeah, I mean, in the, like you said, um, and throughout my career, I know I had the same story at, at Newcastle. You know, people, you don't, you know, you fail a medical, but people look at your record in terms of games. You know, I proved myself I could play games. All it was was an exclusion on the on the contract that if I, you know, if I broke down, it was the ankle, and obviously there was no insurance money. But um, I was out there playing. Like I said, the doc watched the game, and, and he was he was gobsmacked. Um, so I signed, and you know, had three years there. Yeah, I mean, even despite the time you had out, I mean, looking back now, it seems strange that you kind of 
dropped down to Division Two, and I was reading back through the the newspaper cuttings at the time, and the, there was kind of the rumours flying left, right, and centre about where you were going to sign permanently, and uh, one of the rumours that Newcastle were coming in as well. I mean, did you have any other options on the table uh, other than Sunderland to, to sign permanently? No, to be honest, like I said, I, I actually asked Colin, "Can I speak to to Dennis?" I rang Dennis and said, "Look, you know, do you want to take me?" And he said, "Look, I need to speak to the chairman, but love to come up." And that's how it that's how it came about. And to be honest, I was, you know, what you know, what papers like. But no, I, I didn't speak to anybody else. You know, if they could agree a fee and sort things out, then I was happy to sign. Yeah, I think we had to to save the pennies during your your loan move because uh, I don't think we exactly splashed the cash <laughs> around that time. Because you, you did sign permanently for about a quarter of a million in the end, and you went on to play forty six games in all competitions. Uh, in in what was pretty much your, your first full season on the pitch after that injury in the timeout. I mean, did you ever have concerns after you'd come back that you'd find it difficult to play that amount of games? Um, no, uh, like I said, all it did was I altered the way I played a little bit. I was a bit more of a holding midfield player, whereas before when I was at Everton, I was more of a box to box midfield player. <clears throat> and that was really just probably from the restriction. But no, I, like I said, in terms of the ankle and the injury, I just looked after it. You know, I knew what, what I could do and what I couldn't do and, and just managed it, really. You've answered my next question, which is great, but because I, I was going to ask whether it was a, it, it was the way Dennis Smith asked you to play, because watching the footage of you in, in an Everton strip, you know, constantly kind of getting into the box with those forward runs, and then it seems to be that you either consciously adapted your game, came to Sunderland, and just made things tick in the middle with Gary Hours and Armstrong doing doing all the running. Yeah, I mean, they were the young lads at the time, so they had the legs, and it and it suited me the way. Like I said, with the restrictions, really, you know, I, w- I would would have been twenty. I don't know, 26, 27 then. Yeah. So, and it, and it worked, you know. Um, they trusted me with the ball and I was sort of, like you said, the playmaker, really. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, I mean, really young side. Uh, you know, we've mentioned Gary Howes and Gordon Armstrong, but obviously Marco Gabardini was was young and we had a lot of young players coming through. But, I mean, even, as you mentioned, kind of 26, 27 when you signed again, did Dennis Smith kind of put uh, any onus on you to, to help develop those players, especially... Kind of Gary Howes and Armstrong, who you played alongside in the field. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to think, hopefully, you know, later on in the career, in terms of you know being captains and, and and managing and coaching, is you know that that would be one of the things that not only were they buying somebody that on the field, but off the field as well, in terms of how you look after yourself, a winning mentality. You know, once you've experienced it, you know, you want to pass that experience on. Uh, what's right and what's wrong, and like I said, they were. There were some good young players there who listened, who wanted to get better, who wanted to learn. And, and it was a little bit of, of a voice of, you know, of, of a captain, of a leader, which you need on the field as, as well as off the field as well. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, obviously we'd come up from Division 3, finished mid-table the season before. And I think you'd only kind of really added yourself. And I think it was Paul Hardyman as well. But um, I think putting you into that midfield with, you know, the, the young lads, like, I was an Armstrong who were 2021 and uh, I think Colin Pascoe was quite young on the left as well. I think he was only about 23, 24 at the time as well. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I think as Dennis Smith kind of put it himself a couple of times, I think you were kind of that final piece in the jigsaw just to, to make, you know, kind of to keep things ticking over in midfield while they did all the running. So Yeah, and I, and I think it worked, it, it worked well. You know, like I said, they were very, um, very keen to listen and learn and, and, and learn good habits and, uh, it was a good place to be, you know. Uh, I, I, like I said, I enjoyed, enjoyed my time working with the young lads and, and giving them my experience, even though, you know, I, I had been out for a while at England International, won things, so I knew what it took uh, and I enjoyed passing that experience on to them. Yeah. Well, well, that season, of course, ends with uh, with the playoffs and Fiat pits us uh, against Newcastle United as they finished third and we finished sixth. Uh, and I'm fairly certain the, the FA were, were eternally relieved at not having the prospect of uh, some of the Newcastle fans invading London for a bank holiday weekend. Um, but, I mean, considering all the cup finals and international games you played in, uh, are those two games against Newcastle in that playoffs up there with, with some of the, the top uh, kind of big games you had in your career? Yeah, I mean... Obviously, derbies up here, you know, very similar to the to the Liverpool derbies as well, you know, um, very passionate. And I think the way it went with the first leg, I think Newcastle thought that, you know, they'd done their job really. And we went there, to be fair, and we had, we had an outstanding night, a lot of pressure. Obviously, the crowd came on to clear the crowd and uh, we managed to, you know, get an unbelievable result because I don't think anybody really fancied us going there and getting that result. Um, and then, obviously, brilliant to go to Wembley, you know. 
Yeah. I mean, was, was that the mentality after that first leg? Was it just thinking, you know, everybody's written us off here and we're going to go there and, uh, and you know, cause an upset? Well, I, I think not internally, but externally, you know, I think anybody was said, oh, it's going to be a tough ask now going to St. James's with a full house, you know. Um, but like you said, we went there, we played some real good stuff and we, and we got some, you know, got two great goals and under a lot, a lot of pressure. Um, and it was a fantastic night, but it was only the half half a job done, really, because you've yeah. got to go to Wembley and, and finish it off, you know. Did you manage to get off the pitch okay when the fans came on at the end? To be fair, the ref was brilliant. You know, he, there was a lot of talk and they said, there's no way this game's not going to finish. We can't, you know, we can't have supporters because, you know, if we get in this position and people invade the pitch, then we're never going to finish football. So, they, you know, we waited, cleared the pitch and, and, the, and the ref said, no, I'm going to play the time. I'll, I'll give you a goalkeeper a a shout when I'm getting close because he's obviously the furthest away to get off the pitch. It was a referee and a, and a, and a police matter, and it was a, you know it was a question that you know we're going to have to wait till it's cleared, and all we had to do was concentrate and make sure we we finished the game and, and got the result. And uh, luckily enough, hopefully we all got off safely. And I must admit, we did stay at the ground for for, for a long time for you know for obvious reasons, you know. Yeah, and I think uh, afterwards, did did the coach head straight into Sunderland uh, Town Centre after the no, game? No, I don't think so. Off the top of my head, I think. Uh, having a night like that, I think we're just pleased all to get home and, and look forward <laughs> look forward to the uh, to the final, you know, at Wembley, which was, which was brilliant, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was it was the first season of the uh, Wembley playoff finals. Um, yeah, and uh, it was just kind of one of those days we we didn't get going, and then early on Calderwood kind of took Gabardini out of the game, and then we had Tony Norman to thank that that we only lost by a single goal in the end. Yeah, I just I just remember it was. Um, they were a good side at the time, yeah. and uh, I think we were we were well beaten. But I think they deserved to win on the day. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about. I mean, even before or after the game. I mean, were were there any whispers that you know, regardless of what the result might be, it wouldn't be the end of it with uh, the Hannah kind of Swindon's financial uh, problems? Um, I don't know. Like you said, it was a strange time, and then obviously when they got the result, and then there was a, there was a lot of stuff going on, uh, and then you know. At the end of the day, they were found guilty, and that was it, you know. So, um, you know, it was brilliant for us, and not so great for them. Yeah, to, I mean, because usually playoff finals one of the best ways to, to get promoted, but uh, it was a strange way to get promoted that we couldn't kind of celebrate it as a. No, it was yeah, it was it was a little bit surreal, um, but ultimately you, you take it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're never going to turn it down. But uh, Dennis Smith said. Uh, since uh, it was probably too soon, and, and the club weren't in a in a position to back him up. I mean, would you think that's fair? Well, he would like he would know in terms of the ins and outs behind the scene. You know, um, mm. as, as a player, if you're, you're thinking great, brilliant promotion. You know, next level. Uh, here we go. Really, in terms of players, you don't know the politics that goes on behind the behind the scenes. Obviously, Dennis would, would know that more than us. You know. I mean, in that season, we played some great football. We beat Manchester United and a couple of. Great games against Spurs, uh, but I mean that season we actually managed to to lose eleven games where where we took the lead. I mean, do you think? Uh, I mean, was that a sign of the style of football we played, or or was it a sign of because we had a really young squad still at that point as well? I, I, I think probably a little bit of naivety, but I know Roker Park was a you know we made it a real difficult place to come and play. We enjoyed playing there, uh, and like you said, you know, young, hungry, um, but we you know I think we did okay, held our own to a degree, you know. Yeah, and that's possibly why you know Dennis mentioned to you that he, he probably wanted the strength and the, and the money wasn't there. I don't know. You know, so one of those if only because uh, we obviously went down to the the last day at Main Road, which is obviously still talked about. You know, with with Sunderland fans estimated to be about fifteen thousand there, and I think uh, Dennis Smith again he he said that convinced him to have another go. Uh, what are your memories of that day when we went down? <sighs> well, like you said, when you've got you when you when you carry that sort of support. You know, it's amazing, really. I, I don't know. It, it's difficult to explain the disappointment, you know, um, mm. because you're on such a high from, you know, from circumstances of getting up there and then you go on such a low. But yeah, again, in football, you've, you know, you have to dust yourself down and go again. And my experience, like I said, of being out injured for, for two and a half years is you've got to go again. You've got to think positively and, and look forward to the following season. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, you say that you obviously you were back in Division One with Sunderland, you know, got us there. I mean, having having that taste of it, obviously the the disappointment of going back down. I mean, was there any kind of discussion? Was it was it just simply you didn't think twice and you were staying with the club, or, or did you fancy you know maybe a move to to another Division One club? No, to be honest, it didn't cross my mind. Um, like you said, it was dust yourself down and go again, really, and it never really crossed my mind to be honest. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, the next season, you know, back in Division Two, um, and Dennis Smith again hadn't really been backed in the transfer market and hadn't been able to kind of bring anyone else in, and he's forced to, to sell Marco Gabbadini early on in that season. But kind of just to pause on the subject of Marco Gabbadini, I mean, he was obviously kind of ruthless for Sunderland. You know, scored twenty plus goals, and I think uh, I think three or four season straight and then scored I think he scored double figures in the um or almost double figures in the division one I mean from that early potential do you think it was just one of those things where he kind of moved on and it didn't quite work at Palace and maybe he didn't kind of achieve what what that kind of early potential uh promised well like I said early on in, in the in the conversation when you move club uh you know he'd been at York came to a big club in Sunderland things have gone well it, it's it's a you know Every every signing, every manager will tell you every signing is, is is a gamble. You're buying somebody and you hope, you know, and Gabby's is going to score goals because his record said he's going to do that. But you've got all the other stuff as well, moving new new teammates. So all that contributes to whether it's, it's a successful move or, or it isn't. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. Yep. Dennis Smith uh, does sell Mark Gabbardini and he, he brings in John Byrne, Don Goodman and on Rogan, but um, he still couldn't quite get us going. And then just uh, uh, just after Christmas, after going down 3-0 at Oxford, Bob Murray sacks Dennis Smith. I mean, how much of that was a surprise, bearing in mind, you know, what he'd done for Sunderland over the previous years? Nothing surprises me in football. <laughs> and, and obviously... You know, prior to that, like you said, he, he obviously thought, you know, if I, if I sell Gabbers and I can bring those players in you've mentioned, it brings me four or five players in and, you know, we'll go again. But, you know, Dennis knows it's all about winning um, when you're in management, as I know myself. So I'm sure he would have been disappointed at the time that he wasn't given more time. Um, but sometimes in football, you, you know, things that you, you don't get time and they made that decision, you know. Yeah. And then uh, Martin Crosby gets the job as a caretaker manager. And uh, even though we, we still struggle in the league, we go on that amazing cup run uh, with that never-to-be-forgotten quarter-final replay against uh, Chelsea at Rocker Park. I mean, that year, was it just one of those unexplained football phenomena where we could turn it on in the cup that year, but we still struggled in the league because we had some really good players in that squad? Yeah, it was... And I, I think sometimes in cup games, and I think we sort of proved that, you mentioned the Chelsea, you know, when we're at home and it's... It's a big night, big crowd, expectations. Um, we got some great results and we couldn't then recharge our batteries and go again in the league, you know. And, and that was, that's always a difficult balance between you want a good cup run, but you obviously you've got to look over your shoulder with the league, you know, your league's your bread and butter. But it was a, you know, it was a magnificent run um, and, and to get to the, uh, to the cup final was, was fantastic, like you said, with the, with the players we had and fantastic for the club as well. Yeah, it's it's your fourth FA Cup final. Uh, I mean, were you passing anything on to the younger lads to say that this is what it's like, or were you, were you just letting them experience it for themselves? Well, I was hoping it was going to be one that I was going to win. To be honest, having lost the last three, so um, but again, Wembley. You know, people talk about you know players that have played in the career never played an FA Cup final. I was lucky enough to play in four, didn't win one, um, but fantastic experience. Again, I'd like to think. Because I'd been there and seen it and done it, um, the experience helped helped in the quarterfinals and the semis and and ultimately in the final. But um, if memory serves me right, we we, we could have been one 0 up in the first half. I think we were the better side. Um, but in the end, I think their quality told. You know, as soon as Liverpool got that opening goal, Michael Thomas, I think it was. Uh... I think that we couldn't get the ball off them after that. But uh, that first half, we had, we had a couple of good chances in that first half. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think they made a couple of subs, and that I think. That sort of changed the game a little bit, but you know you've. Uh, I think we hit the post. If things go in, and all of a sudden it's a different, it's a different kettle of fish, you know. I mean, after after that cup final, uh, you bizarrely find yourself out, out of contract as the as the clubs only offered you a, a one year deal, and this was kind of before the the Bosman ruling, of course. But uh, so you're allowed to talk to the uh, other clubs. But I mean, for me, obviously another example of uh, how badly the club was run at the time, uh, because I. Can't really get my head around, uh, you know, that the fact that you weren't kind of 
going through those conversations earlier in the season? I mean, was there nothing discussed kind of prior to, to the end of the season? Was it not ongoing throughout the season, those discussions? <laughs> Well, the way the way it worked in those days is they had to offer you a contract by the third Saturday in May, and I think the cup final was that probably third Saturday in May, and my contract was up. Um, they'd had a board meeting, I think, prior to um, the cup final because obviously Crozer was um, he was a caretaker manager at the time, um, or he, he could have been main manager. I'm not quite sure. Obviously, Crozer wanted to keep me, um, but what happens is you get back from the cup final, and there's obviously a letter. And they offer me a, a one-year contract. A lot of it to do was because he's thirty, and but that's what you know. The, the club are entitled to offer you what they want. Uh, I, I thought I was worth more than a one-year contract. So in those days, you had to officially turn it down, which I did. Took the paperwork in, and what happens then is your name gets circulated on the list, retaining list, and then I got a phone call through a friend uh, in Liverpool saying we've just had the retaining list out, and your name's on it. They're not quite sure, you know. Is, is that right? Is it true? Um, I said, yeah, yeah, I've, I've turned the contract down. I can speak to who I want. And, and that's, how it, that's how it went, really. I was asked to go on, I go and speak to, to, to Kevin at Newcastle. So I just said to, to the wife, just put the answer machine on and I'm going to speak to, um, to Kevin. And as you can imagine, being the Sunderland captain and going to speak to Kevin it was always going to be difficult. You know, being a captain is... Of any clubs, you know, is, is is special and no different than being a captain at Sunderland. You know, really enjoyed the time there and the respect that that comes with it. You know, uh, I met Kevin, and the first thing he said to me, "If if you walk out of the room now and you want to sign, I quite understand." Um, we agreed a three year contract, and then the following day had a medical again, which I didn't pass. And Kevin spoke to to Bob Murray to try and sort a fee out, um, which they couldn't agree. And then it went to a tribunal in those days. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I just feel uh, it just uh, it just shows how much of a basket case we were as a football club at the time. Um, you know, and I, I think I read somewhere that you uh, you actually you didn't just kind of send it back to them, but you actually took it to the club, you know, and give it back to them, you know, in person because you wanted to you wanted to actually give your your reaction to that contract offer. Well, I was I was making sure that I was doing things properly. You know what I mean? Um, and I handed it back in. And obviously they was they were surprised, but you know that, that was that was their their right, their entitlement, the same as me. Um, I felt I was worth more than a, a year's contract, and and that's and that's how it was. Um, and and we went to a tribunal, and I think uh, the fee was set again at two fifty, and uh, I went to Newcastle and scored on my debut. So um, I always knew it was going to be a massive move. I always knew that if things didn't work out, I was going to get it. Obviously, being at, uh, at Sunderland, but I had four fantastic years there. Um, you know, that was the entertainers. Um, yeah. I really enjoyed my time there. Yeah, and, and just in that on, on that tribunal, wasn't it uh, a case Sunderland asked for more money, and the the point was raised. Well, you know, why why did you only offer him one year if uh, if he's <laughs> if he's worth that much? Yeah, there was a lot of evidence put forward to. Uh, for the do's and the don'ts and why's and why nots. Um, ultimately, it, it was an independent tribunal. They listened to both sides of the story and then they set the fee, you know. Um, and, and that, like I said, that was it. It was once the fee was set, they, they paid it and, and we moved on, you know. Um, but again, it was, I enjoyed my time there at Sunderland, but it, was, it wasn't it was to be and, and I moved on, you know. Two more years in the Premier League you had uh, with Newcastle as well, which, which is incredible. And then uh, we get to 1995 and uh, Peter Reid is about to lead Sunderland uh, as manager for his first full season. Uh, and I think it's, it's pretty much his first phone call was to to, uh, to you to try and bring you in as uh, kind of player assistant manager. I mean, did you just jump at the chance to move into the management side or, or did you want, did part of you just want to keep concentrating fully on being a player? Well, to be honest, I think I was, I might be 35 and we're in the premiership in Newcastle. Things have gone well and I knew Again, from my experience, I wasn't going to play as many games as I'd like to. Um, spoke with uh, with Reedy, who obviously had a I played with a new, and um, he wanted to bring me back, and, and that was my first sort of step into uh, management as, as going back as assistant player manager. And again, I came back. I wasn't quite sure on the reception I would get, but I think the one thing that I've learned, obviously in the northeast, is um, you know people judge you what you do on the field, and um, we came back and. And it was brilliant, you know. It was my first taste working with, with Bobby, Sex, uh, Bobby Saxton and, and Reedy uh, on the management side. But first and foremost, I was there as a player, you know. And 
as soon as the train finished, we got in the office, we discussed things, and then really we say, right, off you go, get your get your feet up, big game tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a real insight to you know what happens uh, behind the scenes in management. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how did you find that role? You know, being one of the lads, you know, out on the pitch, but part of the management team as well. Was it difficult to adjust to that? No, what I did, I was from the outset when I came in. Um, I was very conscious of that, so I changed in the management. During the week when I trained, I was always in the management uh, changing room. The only time I changed was was on a Saturday or a Wednesday when I was with the players as a match day, so I didn't want any tittle-tattle or anything like that. Mm. Everybody knew that I was part of the management team, but they also knew I was only going to get picked on merit if I produced the goods on a, on a, you know, on a match day, which is how I'd want it to be, and that's how it was with Reedy, you know, so... Um, just because I was assistant manager it didn't guarantee me a place um, but what it did do was it gives again really his eyes and ears on the field as well you know yeah well I mean you said uh, you need to do it out on the pitch and I've, I'm fairly certain uh, going off memory I think you won kind of player of the month for the first three, <laughs> three or four months that season um, and you went on to play 44 games in total as we kind of won won the title after being relegation candidates the season before. I mean, how special was that title, you know, coming back and uh, especially because it was kind of out of the blue um, with, with kind of changing our fortune so quickly. So was that, was that a pretty special championship? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, you know, it was quite ironic really where, you know, I'm 30 years of age, they offer me a year because I'm not quite sure about me, me ankle and things like that. <laughs> and I'm coming back at, at 35 and like you said, we're, we're getting promotion and playing. And goals, and again, when I came back, never passed the medical and things like that. So, um, but no, really enjoyed, really enjoyed that. Uh, again, we rode apart. It was, it was, it was a good, good place to be. It really, was again building, you know, with some good young players, some experienced players, and obviously the staging was then um, starting to come along as well. Hmm. I mean, that that impact that you had was it? Was there any? Kind of apologies for the boardroom saying, actually, you know, <laughs> we should offer you a better. No, it's, it, that's football. You move on, you know. And, and I know, you know, even to this day when, with Bob Murray, when I've been back, back to the ground and shake his hand, we'll have a cup of tea or, or a drink or whatever. That's, you know, he, they made the decision and I made my decision. But uh, you just move on. That's that's football, you know. Um, but I was, you know, I've had, like you said before the intro, I've had three spells there. You know, seven years, a big chunk of, of my career there. So, you know, I was delighted to go back and, and bring some success. Yeah, as, as you said, I mean, 34 and you're, you're ready for another season in the Premier League and it's the last one at Roker Park. Um, but I mean, that one, you saw it from a player's point of view with uh, Alan Durbin and later Dennis Smith when they were kind of really backed at Sunderland to push on. Um, I mean, do you think specifically during that season in the Premier League with the move to the new stadium and the speed of the progress you and Peter Reid were making, um, do you think you suffered something similar that year? Again, it's, you know, I was privy to some of it, but not all of it because my my sort of concentration was on the pitch and I know uh, Reedy and the staff were working really hard to try and get people people in and there was a balance in act like there is very much today in terms of stager and players, you know, and I, and I think that was exactly the same with Reedy. He was trying to, you know, he was conscious of the, uh, the stage and, but obviously he wanted money for players and trying to get the right players in at the right price and, and making sure that the ones that came in, you know, did what they said on the tin. So it was a difficult time. But And at the same time, you've got, you've got to win football matches as well, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that season in the Premier League, you, you were actually in, an ever-present um, during that season in the Premier League. And, I mean, unfortunately, we have, you know, pretty horrific injuries to, to Niall Quinn and uh, Tony Corton as well. I mean, that luck seemed to be against us quite a lot that year. Um, but, but, I mean, we end up uh, getting relegated. But how, how big a blow was that to yourself and, and Peter Reid? Yeah, I mean, I've, you've just mentioned two sort of major, major, you know, players in the team. You know, anybody that loses those two types of players and characters is very, very difficult to replace. You know, um, and that was a blow. You know, because there were long, there were long term injuries as well. And how how did you find the the move to the to the stadium alight and the move from Roger Park? Because obviously, an ex player going back quite away. I mean, did, did you feel any kind of attachment to the place? <laughs> to be honest, when you when you think about it now. You know, there's there's been a lot of clubs have gone to new stage, and I would I would imagine some of them was probably one of the very very earliest ones that made that move. You know, mm. um, it was always going to be difficult leaving a, a place like Roker Park because it was so uh, the atmosphere was brilliant and it was known for you know tough and it and it's like you find most clubs find it difficult to 
when they moved to a new stadium to create that. I remember the opening, there was about 47, 48,000 there against Ajax. It was a magnificent stadium, which it still is. So, again, in terms of moving on, you know, you have to move on and, and progress. Yeah, yeah, and you, you played in that game against uh, Ajax, and uh, you play a, a couple of games uh, at the beginning of the next season. Um, but then you, I think, well, surprisingly at the time, I think you left for a similar post at, at Fulham in the division below where I think uh, Kevin Keegan was, was there at the time. Um, and I think uh, you're obviously offered more playing time because I, I don't think uh, you were kind of as never present in that following season. I mean, was, was that decision to move to Fulham, was that just purely to, to extend your playing career? Yeah, and, uh, and you know, we had the conversation really and I knew, again, we knew in terms of the age of premiership, the way it was, that I wasn't going to play loads of games but you know I go back to when you've not played when you've missed two and a half years a big chunk and you miss the buzz of that Saturday Tuesday Saturday um, you know I wanted to play as much football as possible and that was you know that was the reason why I left um, to go on and play and I think you, you know the record tells me that I think I went down there and played two full seasons or, or virtually two full seasons down there so and again enjoyed my time there it was, it was brilliant we missed out in the playoffs the first year uh, and then we got promotion the following year. Yeah, I mean, w- was that was that a difficult decision? Because obviously, I mean, the pull of having that extended playing career. But I mean, you know, you were kind of two years into um, that partnership with Peter Reid, and and it had been successful because you you weren't really expected to take us up in that first season. So w- was that a really tough decision to move to Fulham? Yeah, obviously Peter didn't want me to go, but you know he'd been a player, he'd had injuries, and he understood, you know. He understood that I wanted to play uh, and that's, you know, it was a big decision because I could have stayed and obviously not played as much and then done more on the on the management side. But, you know, I, I still felt as if I had too much off on the field and, um, you know, he was reluctant, but he, he understood and, you know, we still um, speak very frequently today anyway. So we're still best of mates. There was nothing animosity about it. He, he fully understood I wanted to go and play football. Yeah, yeah, and it, well, as, as he said, it was a it was a good move to follow him, and uh, and kind of you, you stayed uh, stayed active in the game. Um, but then a long gap until uh, your next spell at Sutherland when you return uh, again as a development coach at the academy. I think it was in twenty thirteen. So how did how did you end up coming back? Well, I still kept me place in the northeast, and obviously Jed McMe was there when I was there. Alec Dickman was there, so there was a lot of players there. Uh, previous people have been there but when I you know I took over as manager at uh, at Fulham for a year and then I was out of work and then went to Halifax uh, and managed there for just over a year and then came back and I always um, had an affinity with 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 the academy you know trying to develop plays even when I was a manager at Fulham and also at at Halifax I always looked to try and get players from from the academies and with the contacts and, and bring young players on so I went in and and did some work individually um, with Jed on, on a sort of part-time basis, which I really enjoyed. We, the lad Barley, funny enough, he was um, he was thirteen at the time. Worked very closely with him, and then the opportunity came to um, to work in, in in the academy, which which I really enjoyed. You know, yeah, and, and I'm I'm sure you were used to from your first three spells at the club, but as always, the, the club seemed to be in constant uh, turmoil again, churning through managers. Um, and then in, in 2015, Dick Avocat asks you uh, to kind of fill a role with the first team. I mean, did that transition happen straight away when he was appointed? Be- because I think it was touch and go whether he was staying on in that summer. Yeah, Lee Congleton was the sporting director at the time, and um, I didn't know I didn't know Lee. Lee obviously took over the over the role there, and um, he'd seen me work in in the uh, academy. Obviously, knew of me my history of, of being there as a player and a captain, assistant manager, and when Gus Poet left, they brought uh, Dick in and, and they asked me, I'd, I'd never met Dick before, look, he's, he's only got, I think it was 10, 11 games um, to go, would you help him? So, yeah, brilliant. So I met Dick, he was, he was, he was the general, he was brilliant, he really appreciated because you can imagine coming into a, into a club, don't know anybody and I tried to give him as much help as, as possible in terms of the players and the younger players and, and what was needed. And it was an unbelievable journey, really. We managed to stay up, which was which was incredible, really, because I think at the time we, we looked as though we were going to go down. Yeah, well, I think that was the, that was the big search to get him to to stay on that summer, but um, it, it didn't quite work work out of the season uh, after that. But uh, uh, that led to Sam Allardyce taking over the reins, and I know 
he'd worked at the club under Peter Reid when you were there. So it seemed from the outside a natural transition when you stayed on as his assistant. Was that the case? Um, I, knew, like, I knew Sam obviously before, didn't know him uh, as, as well as I do now. And he came in and he was very open and honest. He said, Brace, I know you, but I don't know you. Um, I'm going to have a look about and look at all the staff. If I want to make changes, I'll, I'll tell you. And he, I think he was about a week, 10 days into the job. And then he pulled me in the office one day and he said, Brace, I like what I see. I want you to be my assistant manager. I want Robbie to move up with first team coach. And and that he said, look, let's let's go on the journey. Let's see where it takes us. Um, <laughs> and, and again, we managed to stay up, which was, which was unbelievable, really. Yeah. And then, obviously, England came knocking for the big Sam, you know? Yeah. I mean, you must have been, I imagine, you know, even within the setup, because I mean, I know... Uh, the fans were looking forward to that season, the first full season under Sam Allardyce, and I imagine it was the same behind the scenes as well. Yeah, it was. We we just, you know, we managed to still. We were playing some, some we had some good players in. We were mm-hmm. playing some good stuff. I mean, the the last week of the season was incredible. You know, the the games at home, the results we've got. Yeah. Um, to stay up again was it was like winning the FA Cup. It was it was an incredible atmosphere. Um, really enjoyed working with with, uh, with Big Sam, but obviously. England comes knocking and, and then he and then he leaves and this similar sort of thing happened when, when uh, David Moyes come, came in again he came in and, and sat with the staff and said look don't really know you but I'm just going to have a look and have a feel and, and then I'll make my decision and, uh, again he pulled me in and Robbie and said look uh, you know I want you to work with me and the assistant first team coach and, and we went from there really yeah I mean, I mean just going into that season do you think uh because it always seemed that we never really recovered from the shock of, of Allardyce leaving and, and we were kind of always playing catch-up. I mean, did it have that feeling within the club that we we were playing catch-up because um, we were so disrupted by Allardyce leaving? I think it was it was difficult. We'd, we'd done, we were, everything had been done pre-season. We were out in Austria and uh, Big Sam came out. He spent a couple of days and he was going back uh, and then um, he went with England. So it was, I wouldn't say turmoil, but obviously... Um, pre-season was going on I think me and Robbie took the game at Rotherham um, we were just doing what what we, what we needed to do and we were just waiting to see but in terms of the window and, and players and things like that it was obviously time was ticking on and the season was starting and there wasn't much time to to bed things in but you know again David came in and, and, and we got on with it Yeah, I mean it must have been difficult so, so close to the season if there's a change of ideals so close to the beginning of the season. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's never a, never a good time. But like you said, I think every was expectations with with Sam doing such a, you know such a great job staying up, and the, the place was jumping. And obviously, you know, he leaves, and then there's there's that uncertainty which you always get when a manager goes and who's coming, who's going, and um, for the players and the staff. So you know, another sort of turmoil, like you said, from going back sort of eighteen months when uh, when Gus was there, and then Dick comes in, and then. It keeps us up, and then he's he's staying, and he goes. So there's a lot of stuff going on, which doesn't, you know, which is not great for the club. Yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah, I mean, tough year being rooted to the bottom of the Premier League under David Moyes. But obviously, there was it was unclear what was happening with the ownership of the club as well. I mean, it was uh, it was towards the end of that season? Was that you know fairly uncertain what the future would hold for for obviously David Moyes, but but yourself as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, as soon as you um, you know playing's the best. The best part of it, you know, uh, and having been a player and sampled it, and all you're worrying about is yourself and turning it up and make sure you know you do what's best for yourself and the team. Uh, once you go into management, things things do change. Um, there's an awful lot more going on, but one of real disappointment for the relegation, and it was a, it was a tough tough pill to to swallow because of all the uncertainty what was going on, unbelievable support home and away. Uh, and it's a bit like, you know, we managed to do it twice, you know, with Dick and then with Sam. And then obviously, unfortunately, we, we didn't do it with David, um, which was always going to be a big, big ass you know, to, to keep doing what you were doing to try and survive. Yeah. Um, I mean, had, had you made a decision whether you were going to um, stay or leave or, or wait for the club's decision on that? Well, what happens is, um, you know, David went to the only had a meeting in London. Uh, we stayed down because we had the league managers and... You know, David said that he was he was leaving, and uh, Martin Bain at the time just asked me and Robbie if we could hold the fort, and uh, which we did do through through the summer. Uh, and obviously, they were they were looking for a new management. Um, whether they were going to bring their own people, um, you know, 
that wasn't our decision. Um, the only thing I would say is when when they made the decision, uh, Martin was good as gold, um, and, and everything was done properly. You know. Yeah, and then obviously you, you left your your fourth spell uh, with the club. Huge huge ups and downs at the club, um, but you spent I mean, ten years pretty much at, at the club in total, um, on and off the pitch. Uh, I mean, looking back, I mean, how, how much have you enjoyed? I mean, that time, obviously, as I said, huge up and ups and downs. But did you enjoy it overall? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, like I said, you know, going up as a as a nineteen year old, um, the road could raw. You know, I had some real, some real good times. You know, obviously some disappointing times as well. But I had a real affinity for the club, and, and I, I felt as if every time I put the shirt on, they knew what they were going to get from me. Um, you know, assistant manager. Uh, you know, led the team out at Wembley in the cup final. You know, so there was more ups than than downs. But obviously, disappointed the way it finished in the end with with the relegation. Yeah, not not a great way to end it. Um, but um, and obviously, kind of haven't spanned so many eras at, at Sunderland. I mean, what, what what do you see when when you look at the club now? Just one of this real disappointing because it, you know I, I know it, it's a fantastic club, fantastic supporters. If they get it right, whoever gets it right, it's a top six club, you know. And the North East is just hungry for success. And, you know, tasted it with Reedy, you know. Um, so know what it's like in the cup final. I remember coming back after the after the final against Liverpool where we, we get off at, um, at Carville, we get to the Ramside and then, you know, there's there's half a million people, 400,000 people turn up <laughs> on the Roker front, you know. And when we win the championship, you know, all the people that turn out, it's, you know, that's what they live for. And it's a great... You know, it's a great shame where it is, but hopefully somebody will come along and, and do what's right and hopefully in years to come it'll it'll go back where it should be, you know, back in the premiership and battling in the in the trying to get in the top six because that's yeah. the only place to be. Yeah, I, I was I was down the seafront both those days. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like a long time ago now. But yeah, yeah. yeah. it's brilliant occasions, you know. Brilliant. Yeah, but um, I mean, just quickly on the on the current day. I mean, I, I was reading that you're now um, an elite development coach at uh, at, at Grow Football and uh, a consultant for for Tottenham Hotspur. So, I mean, can you tell us a bit more about what you're doing now. Yeah, it's sort of my third spell as a consultant at, at Tottenham. Uh, I work as an develop, elite development coach. So I work with the 23s all the way down to the eights. So we, we work on individual players. Great place to work. Fantastic facilities and Tottenham do produce players, um, which I really enjoy. And then there's the other company, LVH Sport. We've we've got an app coming out, which hopefully should get launched at the end of July, um, which is a fantastic app we've been working on for the last two and a half years, which will be free to download, and it, and it gives you a time and a score, and it's a real training app. Um, we've just managed to sign, um, I'm sure some of the younger people will uh, call F2 stylists, the two boys, and um, we've managed to sign them, so... Hopefully by the end of uh, July, you'll see their stuff on the YouTube and doing all their tricks um, with using the app. So it's it's very busy. I still live in the northeast uh, and I commute. Um, I think obviously I, I can't see myself moving from here. Settled in really well. Um, some good people, but ultimately I enjoy getting on the field and and hopefully at this stage of my career is, is trying to develop players for the Premiership. Yeah. And have, have the youth setups been able to keep ticking over through, through the current uh, situation? Yeah, what we did, we worked right the way up to uh, to the end of May. Um, and what we did is on, on Zoom and uh, and teams with the staff, but all the players that are programmed to do, they all had to video it and send it in. June is usually their, their four weeks off. They get two weeks complete rest and then they'll be into their sort of pre-season programme. But no football, uh, as long as you've got a ball and you've got somewhere to do it, then you can get out and practice, you know. Brilliant. Well, all the best with that, Paul. And on that note, uh, I just want to say thank you very much for your time. As I said, uh, you were a bit of a hero of mine when I was young, and I've absolutely loved the chance to, to get to speak to you about, about those great times. I think you know you were the kind of final pieces in the jigsaw on the promotions uh, under Dennis Smith and, and with Peter Reid. So uh, I've just really appreciated you spending your time with us. So, so thank you very no, much. No, I appreciate you speaking to you. And then, uh, like you said, hopefully someone can be successful in the future. Thank you very okay, much. Chris. I was trying to get through it quickly so you can get the start of the match. <laughs>